Please allow me to introduce to you Dr. Sandra Harris Hooker. Good morning. Good morning. I, I feel like beginning as one of those pastors might say, who is that person that she was talking about? Uh, but thank you. Thank you, Pam, for such a uh, touching um, introduction. I can almost say you guys ditto to everything that Pamela has said uh, because she's already given you such a wonderful welcome. But I would like to say good morning. And on behalf of our president and uh, CEO, as Pam said, Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, we wish to welcome you to Morehouse School of Medicine. To all the persons in the audience and to those joining us online, we're so excited to host today, uh, and we even more exciting to shed a light on and bring focus to, focus to Parkinson's disease. But not just the disease itself, rather the many ways it can alter the lives of individuals and families, and the need for greater research and understanding of the health disparities that are associated with Parkinson's disease. There are nearly one million people living in the United States today with Parkinson's disease, and more than 10 million worldwide, numbers that are only expected to increase in the next five to 10 years. It's a disease that, despite the prevalence, continues not to be discussed broadly or in great detail. And you will hear about why that is the case today which is why we are grateful to the Parkinson's Foundation for partnering with the Morehouse School of Medicine to make this crucial day possible. To all of our sponsors, which Pam have already uh, announced for you, we thank you for your support in making this possible. I also want to thank our friends and colleagues from Emory Brain Health Center, Wellstar, and Beyond Brain PT for participating today. I'm sure the discussions planned for this morning will shed light on critical issues related to Parkinson's, but more importantly, spark collaboration and innovation to make a difference in the lives and families impacted by this disease. Morehouse School of Medicine, you guys, was founded more than 45 years ago with a unique mission to diversify the physician and scientific workforce. We seek to advance primary care and to work toward the elimination of health disparities through programs in education, service, and research. It's our mission that remains at the forefront of everything we do because we know that vulnerable and underserved populations will never ever realize their full potential without health. It's both the length and quality of life. These, are what's, these ideals are predicated on health. So health always comes first. So we do what we do because we must. We must lead the creation and advancement of health equity and pave a way for people to reach their optimal levels of health and in turn, live their best lives. Again, thank you for joining us today and for what is sure to be a thought-provoking and enlightening discussion. I encourage you to connect with Morehouse School of Medicine and to continue to find ways to partner with us in creating a more equitable future for all. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Sandra Harris Hooker. We're always appreciative to have our own to come and again. We do thank the Parkinson Foundation for allowing us to be the host site for this amazing community awareness event. I want to bring someone to you now who's going to come to you at this moment to talk about racial disparities disparities in Parkinson's disease. Uh, Dr. Chantel Bronson is your next uh, speaker to come up. Uh, Dr. Bronson is a board 
board-certified neurologist with fellowship training in movement disorder and sleep medicine. She is currently on faculty here at Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia, and her research interest includes understanding and improving health disparities among African Americans with PD. PD is Parkinson's disease, as we know. You may hear Parkinson's disease, you might hear PD. So we just want to make sure you know that we're talking about the same thing, right? She is the first movement disorder specialist at Morehouse School of Medicine and developed the first movement disorder clinic at Grady Healthcare Systems. We're excited. She's also the principal investigator for a research project called SPARTS, and it is also focusing on Parkinson's. Please welcome to you here and to you at home, Dr. Chantel Branson. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction and greatly appreciate it. Thank you for everything you do, Pam. Exactly what Dr. Harris Hooker stated. Uh, ditto to everything. Thank you. So this morning we'll be talking about Parkinson's disease in the African American community. Uh, thank you all for joining me uh, who are live and people who are um, virtual. All right, so let's get started. I have nothing to disclose. <clears throat> and what we will be talking about is a very brief overview of Parkinson's disease and some of the symptoms. They may or may not directly affect you. Uh, ideally, you want to have a discussion with your primary care provider or neurologist or movement disorder specialist. So briefly, we want to talk about what is Parkinson's disease and how does it work? What is this disorder? Basically, Parkinson's disease is a clinical diagnosis. We determine Parkinson's disease and the disorder based on clinical features or findings that we find on exam. And there are four motor features that we find on exam that help us to determine if a person has Parkinson's disorder, okay? Um, so we'll talk about some of the brief uh, symptoms associated with them. We could be here all day uh, talking about some of those symptoms and or signs. And we'll also talk about some of the treatment um, uh, and therapies for Parkinson's disease. We'll also talk about Parkinson's disease and how it affects the community at large and the importance of trying to get this information out to the African American community specifically. So as I stated before, it is a movement disorder and they're characterized by symptoms that we evaluate for as myself as a movement specialist. Uh, the first symptom is probably the most common. People realize and know that it's a tremor uh, or this is like shaking of one part of the body. You can also have rigidity or stiffness is what we usually call it. And then you can have little to no movement. Your movement kind of slows down. It doesn't completely go away. They're just slowing of the movement. And then there's postural instability. And this is the feeling that you're gonna fall or you're almost leaning backwards. You don't, you're not able to have that uh, stability there. You, I want to just start with some of these misconceptions or perceptions about Parkinson's disease. You do not have to have all of these symptoms to have a diagnosis of Parkinson's. I know most commonly people think, oh, well, uh, I have to have a tremor. Or you look at someone else with Parkinson's and you're like, well, um, I have to have it, the disorder, the disease has to look like this in me. As many people will probably tell you throughout this uh, discussion, Parkinson's disease, it looks different amongst every individual. It is not the same. So, as I stated before, having a resting tremor does not confirm or exclude the diagnosis. There are other features of Parkinson's disease as well, and we could literally have an entire conversation um, about that uh, throughout the entire day because there are so many. We call them non-motor symptoms, and these symptoms can range from uh, mood problems or decreased sense of smell, uh, fatigue, uh, 
problems with thinking. Uh, so there are so many different types. It's just good to understand that Parkinson's disease just doesn't affect your movements alone. So, as stated before, who has Parkinson's disease? There are about one million people in the U.S. living with Parkinson's disease. And 60,000 Americans are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease each year. More than 10 million people are living with idiopathic Parkinson's disease. And men are more likely to have Parkinson's disease than women. White Americans are more likely to have Parkinson's disease than Black or African Americans. The Parkinson's Foundation has put together a Parkinson's Foundation Parkinson's Prevalence Project. Say that five times really fast. <laughs> and what they're looking at is how many people in the United States has Parkinson's disease at one given time. So prevalence is a time and space that we're looking for to see how many people have Parkinson's disease. So they estimated that 930,000 people in the U.S. with uh, PD by 2020, and 1.2 million people in the U.S. with Parkinson's disease by 2030. They also put together a Parkinson's prevalence map by state, and each part of it shows exactly how many people in that particular state is diagnosed with Parkinson's disease at one given time. So, why are we here today? To talk about Parkinson's disease in the African American community. We do know that based on research, and you're gonna hear me say this word several times, based on research, we do know that there's a lower prevalence, once again, one given time, the number of people with the disease uh, of Parkinson's disease compared with non-Hispanic whites. We also know, based on research, that there is a delay in the diagnosis and access to treatment. And this treatment, uh, we'll talk about as well, can include something such as physical therapy or exercise. We also know from research that there are misperceptions of motor performance with aging among Black or African Americans. We understand as well that racial disparities may directly impact the prevalence of Parkinson's disease among Black or African Americans. So, why is this happening? Why are there various different biases in Parkinson's disease and the delay in diagnosis among Black or African Americans? The first question we want to know is, are there gaps, maybe gaps in the quality of communication from myself as a provider, or other providers throughout the United States? Are there problems with the communication, with communicating with other people within that community? Are there patterns? So are maybe if we're in a certain area and the communication um, isn't conveyed, clear, clearly conveyed to someone. You know, as a provider, we have about, what, 20, 30 minutes to have a conversation about a very, very important disease, which we could uh, ideally talk about all day, correct? So sometimes we have to see if there are differences. Maybe there's differences in provider recommendation. Are there differences in patient acceptance of treatment? Do we understand what this disease really is and that it is a disorder and not a part of normal aging? How do we analyze this data? Based on research, as I've already said, that we've already looked at many of these uh, concerns or, prob or uh, possible problems such as location and attitudes, comorbidities, geographic location, we've determined that there's still a difference or a delay in the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease among Black or African Americans despite the, um, there being no, no changes within geographic location or attitudes or location. So, we're gonna pause here and talk a little bit about treatment and then we'll go back to how do we help with the communication perspective and how do we provide that outreach and understanding and improvement of discussion of Parkinson's disease within our community. So we're gonna talk a little bit about treatment of Parkinson's disease. 
As stated before, to give you a brief synopsis of what we've already talked about, Parkinson's disease is a clinical diagnosis. It is based on motor symptoms, but there are also non-motor symptoms that can occur as well. There is treatment, and treatment does improve the symptoms of the disease based on research, but it does not stop it, or, and there's no cure to date. So what are some of the possible treatments and management of Parkinson's disease? One of the treatment can be exercise. If you didn't know that, exercise can improve the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. This includes increasing physical activity to at least about 2.5 hours a week, which can slow or decline, um, improve the quality of life. This exercise can be what you, you know, are doing at home or most physicians will recommend or refer someone to a physical therapist to help with making sure they're providing guided exercises that work directly for them. So there's various different ways to get involved or get in contact with someone to refer you to a physical therapist, starting with your primary care provider or neurologist. Uh, the Parkinson's Foundation has a toll-free uh, helpline to provide that as well. Occupational therapy is also another form of therapy and treatment for Parkinson's disease. As I stated before, there are clinical symptoms where your movements are slow. You have slow movements and therefore doing various different activities such as writing, some people love to paint, um, that can interfere with their, uh, with their activities of daily living. The Parkinson's Foundation also provides the recommendations and this can be found on their website. Ideally, exercise should be a part of your treatment plan with Parkinson's disease. Medications, yes. There are medications for what we call symptomatic management or symptomatic treatment for the, Parkin the treatment of Parkinson's disease. And all of these medications are to help with decreasing dopa increasing dopamine in the brain. The cause of Parkinson's disease is usually due to a decrease of the dopamine in the brain. And so all of the medications, either directly via levodopa, which is combined with carbidopa, called carbidopa levodopa, or indirectly to increase the dopamine in the brain. Back to our regular scheduled programming, we want to really spread the word. We want to really get the word out, particularly about what Parkinson's disease is, how it can affect our community, and how do we learn from it and grow from it. As I've stated before, I use the word research. All of the information that I've told or talked about in the last 10, 15 minutes has come from research. That is what we do as scientists. We learn and we try to figure out about the disease process, about the treatment options, and what is available and what is not available based on research. And so understanding that we have to get the word out to understand what this disease is and how it affects all everyone, the entire community, is spreading the word. So at Morehouse School of Medicine, we've done a few workshops, which I'll be talking about um, shortly, and uh, talking about more of some of those non-motor skills to once again, kind of just spread the word of what Parkinson's disease is and how it can affect you, not just from a motor perspective from or um, but also a non-motor perspective as well. So we partnered with the Parkinson's Foundation and we had three workshops to understand the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and how it affects our, our mindset through the mental program for mental wellness. Dr. Sean Garrison, a clinical psychologist at Morehouse School of Medicine, 
helped with um, doing that workshop for about one, one and a half hour. And it was a great way to kind of just be able to have a conversation about how does Parkinson's disease affect our mental wellness and well-being. Then we had Jamie Hopkins, Dr. Jamie Hopkins, our exercise physiologist. He also provided an informal workshop discussing exercise, as we stated before, one of the treatment options for Parkinson's disease. Finally, we had uh, Dana, Dana Blissett and Alicia Varani to provide workshop through nutrition and understanding how diet, how diet can help. So these are some of the ways that we want to spread the word and get the word out about what Parkinson's disease is and how can it affect us, not just uh, our motor symptoms, but non-motor problems and throughout our daily lives. And so why is this so important? How do we understand what Parkinson's disease is and why are we here today? As stated before, we really want to get the word out and spread the word because the best way for us to learn how the disease affects us within our community is through research. This is how we learn about every disease. This is the cornerstone of all of the disease process that we know about to date. And really to get that word out and spread the word to say, this is what Parkinson's disease, now we need to understand how it affects us. So we use treatment, we use uh, research to understand the treatment. We use research to understand the, the processes of what the disorder is. And research can sometimes as well determine what medications we should or should not take. And it is important within our community to try to understand, my apologies, now let me go back, <laughs> to try to understand that getting the word out is one part of it. Understanding how it affects our community is another part. And that goes hand in hand with understanding the disease process through research. So I'll also talk about some of the research opportunities that we have at Morehouse School of Medicine to help us better understand the disease and what, how it affects our community directly. So this is a, actually a research project that we work with or um, with Dr. Allison Willis at University of Pennsylvania. It is called Why Me, Why Not? It is a survey study to understand how people interpret or understand how research works in Parkinson's disease with patients. And if they choose to participate and some of the reasons why they would not want to participate in research. We also have a, a, um, another study through the PD generation. And actually this study is looking at genetic testing. And this genetic testing will help us understand how many people in the population have Parkinson's disease due to a genetic disorder or problem. And then finally, we have SPARC-3, which Pam Cooper alluded to earlier today. I am the uh, sub-site investigator, and uh, this is a, a start study, SPARC-3 is a study evaluating exercise in people with newly diagnosed Parkinson's disease who are not on medications. So we want to understand if exercise and how much exercise would possibly be a treatment for, for Parkinson's disease. I just want to say thank you to everyone here today. I want to thank Annie Long from the Parkinson's Foundation. I want to thank the Parkinson's Down Foundation. I want to thank all everyone in the audience and everyone on Zoom who will be joining us and asking questions and understanding how Parkinson's disease and how it may affect you. Um, and I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Stuart Factor, Dr. Lenora Higginbotham from the Emory Brain Health Center, uh, Valeria Gray from Wellstar Kennestone, as well as uh, Ann and Richard Johnson, who are patients with Parkinson's disease, who will be talking to us as well. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Brunson. It wasn't that amazing? Oh my God, the things you can learn that you think you know, but you don't know, right? Thank you, Dr. Brunson. That was awesome, awesome. Awesome. We really appreciate everything that you're doing here at Morehouse School of Medicine. And one thing she said, which is so very, very, very important, participating in uh, clinical trials is important. That helps us challenge, you know, conquer the challenges that we face every day with different health disparities. And if you're interested in participating in any clinical trial here at Morehouse School of Medicine, you can give us a call at 404-752-1975. Again, that number is 404 404- 752-1975. Thank you so much, Dr. Brunson. We're actually getting ready now to have a, a Q&A session by Dr. Brunson. And if you have any questions, if you're online, you know, we have people that's online that's going to be checking your questions so that we may be able to present them. And as well in the audience, uh, Annie. Uh, and Annie is an amazing, let's give Annie a big hand. Oh my God. Annie and Dr. Brunson and the team at the Parkinson Foundation has, have done an amazing job to make this happen for you on today. Not only in person, man, Zoom, Zoom something else, right? You can do anything by live streaming. So thank you for those of you who are at home relaxing, whether you're in your cars listening or in your office. We just want to tell you again, thank you for being a part of such an exciting day here at Morehouse School of Medicine. Dr. Brunson. Thank you. Thank you again, Pam. So yes, we'll take a few questions uh, in the audience live. And again, as Pamela Cooper mentioned, uh, you can put your questions in the chat and we can uh, answer them as well, okay? Um, Any live questions? We have someone in the back who has a microphone. All you have to do is just raise your hand and she'll come to you. If you're nervous or are not sure about uh, what you want to say, they can also ask the question on your behalf as well. So we have a couple of hands raised. Uh, So we'll... Good morning. My name is Al Kashi, and I heard Dr. Brunson on the radio yesterday and decided that I should come. The reason I'm here is that I have a condition that was called essential tremors, wherein when I'm doing something strenuous like trying to drive a hammer and a nail, <clears throat> excuse me, my hands shake. And um, I was wondering if there's a correlation between what I've been told I have, essential tremors and Parkinson's, and if the treatment for Parkinson's in any way helps a person with what I believe I have is essential tremors. That's my question, thank you. Thank you, thank you so very much. That is a great question. And that's what I alluded to earlier on in the beginning of the presentation that while you can have tremor, it doesn't mean that you have a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's, the tremor for essential tremors, the question was about essential tremors, is a little bit different from the tremor or shaking from Parkinson's disease. So most people consider that shaking or tremor that people have from essential tremor separate or different from Parkinson's disease. Now, it doesn't mean you can't have both, okay? So there are people who can have both Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. And going back to what I stated before, given the fact that this is a clinical diagnosis, doctors, physicians, providers, they have to follow you over time to see how your tremor either changes, manifests, or is, or is stable or relatively stays the same. So while you can have a diagnosis initially based on the initial evaluation, subsequent clinic visits or monitoring can potentially change that diagnosis over time because we're looking at clinical features that can potentially change in each individual. Did that answer your question? Thank you. 
We have one more live question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Joanne Murray. I'm a patient of Dr. Branson. She's wonderful. <laughs> and But what I wanted to know is, you know, when I'm hearing the news and stuff like that, they say he died with um, he died from Parkinson's. But when I'm doing my research, they're saying you don't die from Parkinson's. You, you know, you get older, you may get more symptoms, but you don't die from Parkinson's. So why does the news report, you know, well, he, he died of Parkinson's? Yeah, yeah. You might be talking about someone um, in our particular state. Yes, so, correct. The news and Google, they're not our friends. <laughs> So going back to that question, so the original question, if it wasn't heard, uh, was do people die from Parkinson's disease? So the research that we've learned about Parkinson's disease is that most people do not die directly from Parkinson's disease. People can have complications from Parkinson's disease and die as an indirect problem with Parkinson's disease, but most of the time it is not a direct cause of the death, if that makes sense. Did I answer your question? Yeah, that makes sense, but I just don't understand why on TV they'll say he died from Parkinson's. Right. That just kind of makes me nervous. Right, right. And that's why it's so important for us to spread the word, to get the word out, and for us to talk to our providers and, and neurologists and movement specialists. It, it, it is Google and, and the news, right? They're the scariest uh, entities that we have these days. And so sometimes they want to get that not they want to get that uh, click you know they want to get that um, information so that more people will look at what they're talking about and so sometimes they may kind of sensationalize it but based on research most people do the majority of people do not die directly from Parkinson's disease so that is correct based on the research that you've looked at that most people do not die from Parkinson's disease as a direct result Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think there was someone beside you as well with a question. So I have on one on Zoom uh, while she's giving that to her. It says, what is the youngest age you can be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease? So that goes back to the cause, right? We talked about possible causes, one of them being possibly genetic. So it depends on the cause of the Parkinson's disease. Most people are older, most people are over 65, but if there is a genetic cause to the Parkinson's or to the, the disorder, the disease, then they can be younger. They can be as young as 45. Um, so it just depends on the cause. The next question in the audience. Good morning. My name is Catherine Suggs. My husband is Earl Suggs. He has Parkinson's. He's been dealing with Parkinson's now for about eight to nine years. And recently, I've noticed a change. I've looked it up, and I saw something where it says sundown dementia. It's a certain time of the day where he becomes a completely different person, and it seems like he's not aware of what he's doing or his surroundings. And once he goes through this process, he just goes to sleep, and then he sleeps for hours. And I was told by a doctor it could be a sign of him developing some type of seizures, or it could be something related to the Parkinson's symptoms that he has. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, correct. So after years, um, usually it's after about three years. So initially, in the initial diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, people really don't have cognitive problems, and that cognitive means some things like dementia or memory loss or things of that nature. But over time, as the disease progresses, people can develop problems with memory and thinking, uh, such as dementia um, and cognitive problems. And correct, we we, this is a clinical diagnosis, so we want to rule out other possible problems that could be related to the, not directly related to Parkinson's disease. 
So what your providers are doing are ruling out other problems that is not directly related. And then once they've ruled out other things, such as, like you said, seizures, um, some people can have sleep disorders, some sleep trained, so also sleep disorders and things of that nature can be caused by them as well. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I don't see any, oh yes, okay, sorry. Good morning, audience. Good morning, Dr. Branson. Um, my name is Milton Ashiru. You are one of your patients at Grady from Neurology. Um, I read, I read online, it might, be, it might have been Google, one of the Parkinson's um, information I get online. They said that um, most times when people die indirectly of Parkinson's disease, is indirectly of Parkinson's disease, is usually due to falls or pneumonia. Due to falls or pneumonia, that's what they said. Yeah. yeah. And the question I want to ask you is that, what is expected life expectancy with somebody diagnosed with Parkinson's? Great, great question. Um, so yes, correct. Like we stated before with that previous question, it's usually not directly. So as a symptom of Parkinson's disease, people can have what we call postural instability. They feel like they're going to fall backwards. So that fall, then they hit their head, and then that can be potential uh, problem. So the life expectancy, or some people want to know like the prognosis, like what's going to happen in the future. It varies. It depends on each individual person. Parkinson's disease in itself, there's no one pathway to the progression through the progression of the disease. We do have stages and we look at the patient and we define them based on each particular stage. Some people can stay at one stage and some people can progress at another stage. And so it does vary and it changes with time. Um, so mainly to answer your question, it just depends on that each individual and what they are doing, right? So if you're exercising, exercise is shown to slow down the progression of the disease. If if you have more of a tremor or you have less of a tremor, or you have other issues that are not directly related to Parkinson's disease and treating the non-motor symptoms appropriately, then your progression might be as, might, may or may not be as quick or fast. So it is an individual discussion you should ideally have with your prime, your your provider, um, if possible, a movement disorder specialist. Uh, but I know that we're, um, a bit short of specialists these days. Did that answer your question? Yes, ma'am, you are. You did answer my question. Excellent. And then you might provide anyway for the <laughs> <laughs> At least to So we'll definitely have that conversation, right? <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Yes, we have a few more questions. Um, you, you mentioned uh, dopamine, and um, again, my question is, since I have essential tremors, the application of dopamine, would that help with the essential tremors? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the two mainstay treatments that we use for essential tremors now is propranolol and permadone. But... We did, we have, people have used levodopa, carpidopa to treat essential tremor as well. But the mainstay treatments that we use are propranolol and permadone at this time. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I have. Well, my first question is, when was Parkinson's disease first diagnosed? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm asking that question because a statement was made that is less likely in African Americans. And because historically we had a lot of health issues that had not been diagnosed, treated, or even investigated. And I'm wondering, because over the years, I've known a lot of older people, of which I am one now, but they had different type of symptoms, but we may have called them something different, 
long ago. So I guess I want to find out when was it first diagnosed and then maybe I can move up to see yeah. about the number in the population. Yeah, that's a great question. So it was first seen or discovered or evaluated or diagnosed in 1867, if I'm getting that correct. 17. 1817. So close. Six nine. 1817, not 1867, sorry. 1817, the shaking palsy. And it was uh, initially described at that time. So correct. And there have been several reasons why there have been, people have not looked at Parkinson's disease within the black community at all. So we, uh, historically speaking, based on the historical timeline and the events of things, we just, there hasn't been a push to kind of do that particular evaluation or research. And we know now, of course, based on our understanding that that was incorrect or wrong. And our goal is to help increase the numbers of uh, people in our community, in the black community, to help understand Parkinson's disease. And therefore, we want to communicate through the Parkinson's Disease Foundation to understand how do we increase health equity with regards to this disorder. And we also want to have more participation in research among the black community. And sometimes that is very challenging and hard based on that history and based on the previous events that occurred to make it a concern. And in addition to that, we want to dispel some of those misperceptions about this being just a part of normal aging. And I don't have to go to the doctor for this. My hands shake, my, my mom's hands shake, my grandma's hands shake, I don't have to go to the doctor for this. And they're not gonna help me anyway. So we wanna do all of those different things at one time to help improve understanding diagnoses and improve the communication within the black community and as well as dispelling some of those misperceptions. Does that, make, does that make sense? It certainly does. Thank you so much. <laughs> exactly. No problem. Yes, thank you. And I want to say thank you, Dr. Factor, Stuart Factor here. He is um, uh, over the uh, Emory Brain Health. He was the one who helped me with um, remembering that exact date. I greatly appreciate you, and I greatly appreciate you being here and joining us um, in the second half of the panelists. And all of the physicians, uh, we have a few geriatricians here and, and internal medicine doctors, and Dr. Higgin, Nora Higginbotham from Emory as well. So thank you all for being here. Yes, my name is Michael Bernard, and my question was the deep brain stimulation. How successful uh, has there been any, any improvement or success with that type of treatment? Yes, great question, and I'm probably going to look over again. <laughs> that is a great question, yes. There, deep brain stimulation for our Zoom audience and people out there to understand it's another form of treatment. So we talked about medications really briefly. We also didn't get a chance to talk about as much deep brain stimulation, but this is a device or procedure procedure that helps modify or increase that. Um, we've been talking about the dopamine in the brain. And so the question was, do what is it helpful? Does it help and with the treatment? And is there any new research? I, deep brain stimulation has been out for a number of years. Over 20, 1977, thank you. <laughs> 1997, sorry, over 20 years. FDA approved in 1997, and it has been the mainstay treatment for people with Parkinson's disease who may have some problems with uh, tolerating the medication, the carbidopa levodopa, and who may also um, be on a larger amount and therefore having side effects from it. Um, and so we try to talk and have a conversation if needed with each individual about the deep brain stimulation and how it works to help determine if they, that individual person, needs it or should want to, to utilize that. 
Did that answer your question? Okay. Is it helpful? Yes, it is helpful. It is helpful for some people with Parkinson's disease. So they go through a very rigorous evaluation and monitoring to make sure that there are no, no other factors, we call them confounders or other problems, that could lead to complications or problems with deep brain stimulation in the future. So people typically who may have some mood problems or memory problems, we want to treat that, not to say that that is a like you can't have deep brain stimulation because of it, but we want to treat that first. We want to treat any mood problems or any problems related to memory. It will, we have to evaluate problems related to memory, but for the mood problems, we can potentially treat that. And so we want to make sure that is helpful for those who can, who have those, um, can utilize it the best way. Does that make sense? <laughs> Thank you. No more Zoom questions, I don't think. Um, I was diagnosed with mild cognitive something or other. <laughs> and I wanted to know, you said that there, it can help with memory. What exactly would help with memory? No, no, it's the exact opposite. So thank you for asking that question. So my apologies if I uh, was a bit confusing. Deep brain stimulation does not help with memory. And it would be one of the reasons why the person may not be a good candidate for having deep brain stimulation if they have too significant of a memory problem such as dementia or memory loss related to that. So there's testing and evaluations that we do to make sure that they're, they're what we call a good candidate for deep brain stimulation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to clarify that as well. Hi again. My question this time is the copper lipidopa. Um, sometimes I think my neurologist is a guessing game. Uh, my first dose, you know, I've been recently diagnosed and he had me on 25-100 milligrams. And then when I went back to see him six months later, I was telling him that I didn't have any effect whatsoever from the medication. You know, I still had the same problems. And my only problem is um, I have problems turning. You know, that's the only symptoms that I have. And so he put me on 25, 250, four times a day. And I still, you know, having the same issues. and. I guess part of my frustration is like, am I really a guinea pig or what? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, question. and it's just this experimentation. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you so very much for asking that. As I stated in the beginning, Parkinson's disease is a clinical diagnosis. And therefore, the treatment and the diagnosis Parkinson's disease affects each individual person differently. And therefore, the treatment options, which we have our mainstay, carbidopa, levodopa, and exercise, and all of that, deep brain stimulation, we have to tailor those treatment options for that individual. Um, we can call it individualized medicine, individualized therapy. So while one way, which is usually the start of how we prescribe the medication, 25-100, carbidopa, levodopa, one tablet three times a day, may be great for one person. It may not help or benefit another, so we typically would increase it to our trial dose of levodopa, that second drug medication named to 900 milligrams to see how it will help. And so starting at a low dose to make sure we rule out any, they, the person doesn't have any side effects or problems with the medication or take Taking it and then slowly increasing it over time is usually the mainstay, but it can be very frustrating, as you stated, and the concern about being a potential guinea pig is very uh, much a, tr a real concern. And so having a conversation with the provider and making sure of having as much of a follow-up as possible um, to make sure that they understand these are my individual problems and therefore we need to try to improve that problem. 
Does that make sense? Yes, and another problem I have is it seems like uh, the neurologist or my neurologist is like it's booked out so far. I know. You know, yeah. I, I, this is my health and I would love to see somebody more frequent than six months. Yeah, yeah, and that is a problem I probably throughout the United States, unfortunately. We're short staff, there's not many movement disorder specialists, and there are a lot of people with movement disorders, and so scheduling and trying to put them into the schedule and adding them and, put, you know, doing those are, are universal problems that, you know, we haven't learned to fix just yet. Uh, you know, at our institution, we're working with various different types of providers, APPs, and things of that nature to kind of help alleviate some of that so that it won't be such a long time, it's like six months wait, so to break, bring that down a little bit. But that is a problem, unfortunately, throughout the United States. And my next final question would be, I see two different neurologists now, just to eliminate that issue. Yeah, yeah, that's one Is way. that acceptable? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Good. Yeah, that's absolutely acceptable. That's one way. Fortunately, now people are using some of the same EMRs, electronic medical records for right. anybody out there in the Zoom world. So most of the time people can kind of see what they're doing as long as they're, you know, are aware and your insurance is okay with it. It's oh, yeah. usually the insurance that is the main problem, but definitely that's fine. Okay. That's my final question for today. Well, thank you. Thank you all for all of the questions. I believe I'm being cute now. Um, it was great. If you have any additional questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out. And I didn't see any more questions on Zoom, but I apologize if there were questions and due to our weather issue, we may have missed it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Branson. We are so excited. Give her another hand. Wow. You can also go to parkinson.org or G for more information. And, and let me give you a little nugget I found on there that's really good. One of their nuggets, number two, one of their nuggets on parkinson.org is people with Parkinson can have good quality life. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. While we're getting ready for our panelists to come together, we have a video that we would like for you all to see and we're getting ready to set it up so you can learn a lot more about early signs of Parkinson and then hear from some uh, panelists who wasn't able to be here on today. So thank you again, thank you. Thank you. Now the videos. And, and they wanted you to take a five minute break, or a stretch break, right? And remember she said 2.5 hours a week is good if you have Parkinson, even if you don't have Parkinson. So you know what? Go ahead and get your five minutes right now and stretch. And that means you only got 2.25 minutes for the rest of the week. How about that? Stretch at home. Yay! Thank you. All right, so we are going to go ahead and keep our Zoom users uh, engaged. We're going to go ahead and play our early signs video. Uh, but feel free to continue on, people in the room, with your stretch break. Uh, but we're going to continue on with the program. <laughs>
learn how to deal with my Parkinson's disease. I was diagnosed first in 2018. First noticed that I would sit down and my leg would shake and I just thought it was my daughter and where I thought something in the chair was making me shake until we pinpointed down that I was shaking and that I couldn't stop. I noticed I had stiffness in my knees and I thought that was from when I had exercised too hard and maybe sprained my knee. And then I had trouble coughing. My throat would be really dry and I'd cough all the time. Well, I saw my primary care doctor and I told him and then he scheduled me to see a specialist. So it was like within six months. Notice I have constipation on and off. I have crazy dreams at night. I wake up through the night or I can't go to sleep right away. I have a loss of taste of the food tastes different. My driving, um, I drive, I'm not aware of my distance and I crunch clutch my toe with my other foot up when I'm driving. I would advise that they would see a movement specialist, take physical therapy and exercise, and read as much about Parkinson's as they can. So to kick off today's panel discussion, we want to invite Taisha to join us. Unfortunately, she was unable to join us live, but we're so happy to see you and your uh, lovely smiling face today, Taisha. Taisha has been a Parkinson's Foundation volunteer for quite some time now. Taisha is a member of our Mission and Outreach Committee, and she is actually stars in our recent public service announcement, as does her son, William, who you will see in the background today. William is nine, and as Taisha will... As Taisha will mention this later, uh, William is one of her favorite care partners. So thank you both for being here today. Thank you. Okay, so to get you started, Taisha, could you just tell us a little bit about uh, how old you were when you were diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and what were some of your earliest symptoms and challenges that led you to seek out a specialist? I was diagnosed at the age of 35 when I was pregnant with my son. Mm, but my earliest challenges or symptoms occurred when I was in my 20s. And I was, um, I, I'm now 43 years old. Okay. And Taisha, how does exercise help you manage your Parkinson's symptoms? And what other <laughs> lifestyle changes have you made since getting diagnosed? Oh, yeah, the lifestyle changes is big and also exercise. So exercise is essential to me, um, to me managing my Parkinson's. It really gives me like a lot of fuel and energy, as well as it extends the period of time that I'm able to be mobile um, on, a, I guess I, I would say maybe a single dose of medication. I think I'm saying that right. So basically it just extends the time that I'm able to be mobile and it extends it longer and longer the more you, you exercise. That's great. And what resources and support systems have you found most helpful in your journey with Parkinson's disease? The Parkinson's Foundation, and I think it's also the Dystonia. There's a Dystonia group out of the UK that I've gone to the website a lot and found information as well. And Taisha, I know you were diagnosed uh, very young. I know you also have a sibling who unfortunately was also diagnosed very young. And you have both had deep brain stimulation surgery, otherwise known as DBS. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about what led you to do something like DBS and how has it impacted your life? So I was in need of a drastic change in terms of me and my ability to manage the illness. I was having too many off periods that was keeping me from doing the things that I wanted to do daily. And then I, on top of that, I, I was going to work. And so that just really complicated just things in my life and my schedule. Um, so I decided to have DBS because in addition to that, I had maxed out on the medicine. All the medicines that, that people would normally respond to, to Parkinson's, I was not responding to it effectively enough and for long enough periods. So that's why I had DBS. 
That's great. And, and Taisha, what advice would you give to somebody who's potentially experiencing maybe some early signs of Parkinson's? What advice would you give them uh, to encourage them to seek out a specialist? There is no reason why you should sit there and just not be proactive because not being proactive is, is going to result in, a, in, a, in your basically early demise. So, you have to you have to be able to like going to the doctor will give you a window for your success. Well, thank you, Taisha, so much. And thank you, William. And thank you for having me. While we're waiting on our panelists, um, we have Maria Merritt, who is here. Maria has been doing boxing for Parkinson's for how long? About four years. Yeah. So Mar Maria used to teach out of the um, out of De the Decatur Boxing Club. And now where are you teaching? Um, currently, I'm at a Fighter for Life Boxing and Fitness. It's on uh, Metropolitan Parkway, so it's right in the heart of Atlanta. Um, I teach boxing for Parkinson's disease um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 1.30. Um, and just from my experience, it definitely, definitely helps. You have to keep moving. Um, what I would like for all of our participants who wants to participate, please stand up for me. I'm going to warm y'all up. And then I'm going to teach y'all some boxer, a little bit of boxer. And, oh, okay. And it gets some music on too. <laughs> and a little, how, how long? Uh, just a couple minutes. And Maria is one of my favorite boxing instructors. Um, I've been to one or two of her classes and very caring, very compassionate. So if any of you guys are not currently exercising, boxing is one of the most fun and effective workouts that you can be doing. So talk to Maria before you leave and get information about her boxing program. And this, I, I have that bill. Okay, good people. And if you don't mind, if you want a little more space, step out into the um, aisles for me. What I, the first thing I want you to do is just start rolling those shoulders for me. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to go in the other direction in three, two, and one. Reverse it. Good job. Keep going. Good. Bitty circles. Yeah. Yep. Get ready. In three, two, one, to reverse. Yeah, that's good. That's good movement. Give me five, four, three, two, and one. If you have space, I would like you to reach across your body. Bring it back. Yeah. That motion. Three, two, and one. If you are able, if you have space, what I would like you to do is make a big step out. Bring that step back in. It's two, two movements at once. Here we go. In three, two, and one. Step out. Step back in. Good. Keep going. Big step over, like you're stepping over something. Bring it back in. Super duper important. You, you, don't, you don't ever want to start out cold. You want to stretch. You want to go through a lot more different exercises to get you warmed up. But what we're going to do next is go into our boxers. Do I got anybody? Do I have any boxers out here? Any experience? <laughs> it's okay if you don't have it. So, what I, the first thing I want you to do is stand with your feet shoulder width apart. Good job, good job, good job. Yep. So, what you're going to do is 
straight up. I want the chin tuck. Don't leave your chin up in the air. That's the worst thing you want to do. Um, so with your dominant side or with the hand that you write with, I want you to take a step back. Okay, so if you're right-handed, you'll step back with that right hand. If you're left-handed, step back with your left hand. Keep those hands. I like, I like, I like that stance right there. That's, that's, that's a good stance, dude. Yeah. I want you to keep that chin down. Don't lose your chin up in the round boxers. So, the first punch, which is the most important punch, is that lead hand. That's your jab. Okay, so you're going to throw those straight punches. We're in our boxing stance. Our chin is tucked. Hands are up. Good. Elbows are relaxed. So punch number one is that jab. You're going to step this little bitty step into it, and you're going to bring it right back. So step out there and bring it back in. Okay. Here we go. In three, two, one. You'll keep that foot behind you. Yep. Stay in your boxing stance. Don't switch your feet. Everything is backwards and weird until it's not. Okay. Turn those feet back around. So yeah, if you're right-handed, that left foot is in the front. Right foot is in the back. And the opposite for our uh, south paws. Good, okay, hands back up, good people. Hands back up, ooh, I see some good punches over here. So here we go, we still practicing that jab. You're gonna step into it, bring it right back. Left hand for my right-handed people. Switch your feet back around, sir, yes. Good, that's good, yeah, keep going. Ooh, okay, I see some good jabs out here. Okay, good, give me a couple more. Excellent, bringing those hands right back to your face. Good job. Ooh, okay. <laughs> some of y'all may have some boxing experience. Okay, here you go our punch number two, which is your, your, um, your dominant hand, whether you're left-handed or right-handed. So if you're right-handed, we back into our boxing stance. We're gonna push that right hand straight out. Bring it back in. Turn your feet back around, don't switch your feet. Stay in your stance. It's like any good foundation, okay? Keep those hands up. Same route to go out, same route it comes back. Good. Keep punching. Keeping those hands up. Yes, by your chin. Ooh, come on, yep. I see some, I see some good ones. Keep punching, yep. I want you to punch it, I want you to punch it, I want you to hit it hard. Ooh, come on, yep. Excellent, yep. And rotate. As you get used to it, you'll, you'll realize that your whole body, you, it, you need your whole body to throw your punches. So let's put together a one and a two. Most common combination. Here we go, you're gonna throw a left and a right, or a lead hand and a back hand. Here we go. Let me see you guys do it. Oop, keep, the, keep those feet there, yep. Oop, okay. Okay, one, two. Nice. Oh, okay. Yep. Good job, y'all. <laughs> Good job. So this is a little crash course in boxing, but if you are interested in staying physical and actually um, doing something that's fun and challenging, you can come. Uh, you can come see me. It's a program out in Sandy Springs. But uh, the best thing you can do is keep moving. And Maria, where again can people get information about your class? Um, you can visit our website, afighterforlife.com. Um, it's also on the LDBF for Boxing, boxing for Parkinson's uh, website as well. Uh, okay. the, we'll send it out yes. in the, our recap email after the event today. We'll send it a link okay. to your site. So yes. thank you, Maria, for You're being welcome. here. welcome. No problem. <laughs> All right, now we're going to get to our panel discussion, so. Would you prefer me on this mic or? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And we have a very phenomenal right. group. Group 
of people, um, but our panelists, um, I want to introduce you to them. Uh, thank you again for everyone for joining on here. There were a few who were not able to make it, but we have a great group today, this morning. First, we have Valeria White. If you want to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Valeria Gary. I'm a speech language pathologist. I work for Wellstar Kennestone Hospital, and I also do preventive and maintenance speech therapy services on my own. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. And then we have our world renowned neurologist, Dr. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Factor. Um, he is the director of the Emory Brain and Health Center and the Movement Disorders Program at Emory School of Medicine. Um, I'm sorry if I'm doing the introduction myself, but you can introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah, Stuart Factor. I've been at Emory since 2005. I'm the director of the Movement Disorder Center and um, uh, do a lot of uh, patient care and research in Parkinson's disease. Thank you. Then Lenora. Hi, I'm Lenora Higginbotham. I'm a movement disorder specialist at Emory. I've been there not as long as Dr. Factor, um, but at least about four or five years I've been on faculty, but also trained there for movement disorder fellowship and med school. And so it's great to be here. And so next we have Anne and Richard Johnson. You want me to introduce? Okay. I thought you were going to say something really cool uh, about Mr. me. Mr. <laughs> and Mrs. Johnson are a patient and co care partner. Uh, the, Mr. Johnson has Parkinson's disease and uh, he also has treatment of his Parkinson's disease with deep brain stimulation, DBS. We kind of talked about that a little bit before, so he's on the panel to talk to us about that with his phenomenal care partner, um, Ann Johnson as well. So someone living with Parkinson's disease and their care partner. Would that, is that appropriate? Great. <laughs> Um, we will start with a few questions, uh, starting with our expert panelist, Dr. Factor. Um, we wanted to really understand, you know, how do we bridge the gap? I mentioned that in the presentation um, about bridging the gap and learning more about clinical trials for Black and African Americans and just understanding the importance of that. Um, research, of course, is the cornerstone of everything that we do and just understanding that all of the research, all of the information that we have and that I presented some of that this morning is because of the research that we do. So how do we bridge that um, gap? Well, we do programs like this. Uh, I recommend for everybody here who has Parkinson's to go on clinicaltrials.gov, which is a NIH website. That has every trial that's going on that involves sites in the United States so that you could really get a good sense of all the different types of trials that are ongoing. And um, uh, tells you what kind of treatments, what stages of patients. It's not just drug trials either, it's surgical trials and it's um, uh, studies just examining um, you know, biologic features, we call them biomarkers and, and other aspects. Um, there is one trial that we're participating in that's a part of the PG2, which is a genetics trial for Parkinson's and also part of PD Gene, which Parkinson Foundation sponsors and uh, Chantal mentioned earlier. And that one is specifically for African Americans to try and find out you know, is Parkinson's different than African Americans clinically? Do they have uh, particular genetic type uh, issues that um, that Caucasian patients don't or Hispanic patients don't? And so these are really important uh, studies and we really would like to have more uh, African American involvement. If I might, Chantel, the, one of the other questions that um, was listed here was how important is it for diversity? And I think that's really a key point. If you look at most trials that have been completed in Parkinson's over the last several decades, probably 95% of the people who participate in the trials are Caucasians. 
And so in those trials, we know how the drugs work in white people, but we don't know how they work in African Americans or Hispanics or other ethnic groups. And we don't know if the drugs work exactly the same way. There was a gentleman earlier in the Q&A session who talked about how his doctor was changing his meds around. And sometimes we just don't know um, if the medications work the same in one group as opposed to the other. So I think that's an important reason for participating in trials too, so we can generalize it to the whole population and not uh, have it have just data focused on one group. Right, perfect, yes, thank you again. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I tell a lot of my patients, um, in general, you know, we, you're, you're gonna try the medication uh, one way or the other, you know, either before it's approved or after. And so we don't want to wait until after to see if there's any side effects or issues or problems within one particular group or population. So that was a great. I, I think I remember going back a number of years, there was only uh, one clinical trial specifically for African Americans who was on Premipexol. That was probably 20 years ago. And, and um, they only had African Americans in that uh, clinical trial. I don't think there have been any others like that since then. Thank you. Thank you for <clears throat> stating that. Um, so were there, Dr. Higginbotham, um, I think what we wanted to know a little bit about, and I touched on it, it's so hard. There's so much about Parkinson's disease. We would be here all day, literally. Um, but, you know, what are the most common early signs of Parkinson's disease? And what is the best way to approach a, a loved one if we notice the signs or if people around us are noticing some of this? Yeah, this is a great question. And I think, you know, in the spirit of... Uh, the topic we're discussing today, um, we don't have enough data to indicate that there is any major differences between the way African Americans present and the rest of the general population. Again, stating that, and you know what Dr. Factor is saying, we just, the research does not really probably reflect the amount of Parkinson's disease out there in the African American community. And as Chantal was saying, you know, that type of research, we want African Americans to participate, but there are barriers for participation, like mistrust and over the years. And then definitely um, there are studies that indicate that African Americans might actually more likely to um, think that a symptom or attribute a symptom to older age or something like that. So there are definitely barriers out there we need to overcome with the research. And um, I think that that is on us. We need to do more community-based research, like go out there go out there and knocking on doors, essentially, which Dr. Factor pointed out to me, there is one study of the prevalence studies, right, or the indices that we are looking at that talked about African-Americans and how often they get Parkinson's disease. There's one study in the 80s, was it the 80s? Early 80s, where one guy in Mississippi, or a team of people in Mississippi, went out and knocked on doors to figure out who looked like they had Parkinson's and, and who didn't. And then they um, actually referred those people to neurologists and got them evaluated. And um, all that said, I'm gonna, so I'm just gonna, I think there's a lot out there we don't know. All that said, I'm gonna, so I'm just gonna talk, gen there's a lot out there we don't know. All that said, I'm gonna, so I'm just gonna talk generally about just some of the early symptoms. Um, so as, I think it's important to also note that there is not just a motor disease, but a non-motor disease, and there's something called prodromal Parkinsonism or pro prodromal Parkinson's disease, which is thought to precede the motor disease. So the prodromal disease, one of the most telling biggest risk factors that you can have in advance of motor symptoms is something called REM sleep behavior disorder, where you actually act out your dreams at night. It is very hard for the patient themselves to know this. <laughs> so it's a, usually a family member or somebody else who notices it first. It can involve yelling, screaming out, kicking, punching, this sort of thing. And that has a really high risk of developing Parkinson's disease later on. And we do not, as of 
right now have any evidence that that differs in African Americans versus Caucasians. The other biggest non-motor feature, one of the ones that we look at a lot, as Chantal or Dr. Branson mentioned, is loss of sense of smell. So um, that can signify a lot of different neurodegenerative diseases, but it's thought to be a pretty big risk factor for Parkinson's. Um, that said, there are a couple of studies that indicate that loss of sense of smell might be actually just more prevalent in the African American community and might not actually represent as much risk for Parkinson's as it does in Caucasians. But that's another big one. Other parts of prodromal Parkinson's, constipation, some um, fatigue, obviously could be due to a lot of different things, so it's based on the total picture. So those are some of the prodromal factors. And then early motor signs, as we touched on earlier, they usually come down to whether you have tremor or not. So if you have tremor as part of your Parkinson's disease, your first sign will likely be tremor, like a little bit of rush tremor in a hand or a foot or something like that. And it will happen at rest, so when you're watching TV or not doing anything with the hand. Very different from a central tremor. Um, if you don't have tremor, I think that's when it gets harder for people to know, is this normal, am I aging? But in general, those patients present with a lack of movement. So you're not moving as much in your face, decreased emotion or emotional output or just anything like that. Decreased arm swing is another one. Um, it, those are probably two big ones that family members could look out for, or patients could look out for. But definitely slower in general can be the main finding. Um, so that one's a little harder, and about a third of patients with Parkinson's disease don't present with tremor. So it's not that uncommon. If you see a family member and you're worried about Parkinson's, I think you should definitely approach that family member gently. And so depending on your relationship, I assume it's like a close family member, point out the symptom that you're concerned about and voice your concerns. But I think the most important thing to say is there are treatments for this and it might be beneficial to get it checked out by a doctor who could help diagnose anything that might be going on or treat things that are going on. Because I think one misperception is that we diagnose Parkinson's, we're not gonna do anything about it. But we definitely can. And I, and I definitely think you're at this community event, you're learning about it, if you see something that concerns you, the biggest thing is not just to point it out, but just also, you know now, like, go seek a neurologist because there are treatments out there it can help you with. Great, thank you so very much. Uh, Dr. Higginbotham, while I have you, I will ask another question. Oh, we can. Um, what are the advantages to being diagnosed early in the course of Parkinson's disease? Oh yeah, that's early. So I already mentioned one, which is um, benefiting from um, the treatments that we have. Now we don't right now have a cure for Parkinson's disease, but we do have a lot of good symptomatic treatments. And they've already been mentioned, a lot of them, from medication like dopamine replacement medication to exercise, certain types of physical therapy, boxing, to um, all the way to deep brain stimulation, focus ultrasound, other things like this. So we have a lot of great therapies. And what we see all too often and has been studied in research is that African Americans will present with much more advanced disease when we could have been treating those reduced quality of life when we could have been treating those reduced quality of life when we could have been treating those those symptoms. So I think that's definitely number one. And another thing I'll say, things like DBS, which are really effective um, for Parkinson's patients, um, have a little bit of a window. It's a pretty big window, but you can present too late for it. So. Um, to benefit from stuff like that, you definitely need to come in earlier. Um, two more things. 
One other big one is to avoid unnecessary procedures. Um, so I've had patients come in because they've had pain related to Parkinson's and maybe have had spine surgeries or things like this that it's not, it's not super common, but it definitely, I think, a delayed diagnosis could lead to procedures and things that are not necessary. And then finally, as we've been talking about clinical trials, like I do think if you're interested in, in, in research, there are a lot of things like early exercise intervention that Chantal is talking, or Dr. Branson was talking about, and all these things where trials or even observational studies where we look for biomarkers and things like that. Um, Can I just yeah. add, uh, so some of the early trials, there are a number of drugs being studied to see if it slows progression of disease. And those usually involve very early patients who are newly diagnosed and untreated with symptomatic drugs. So there are, you know, recent days, there are some cancer drugs that are being tested for Parkinson's, early Parkinson's and some diabetes drugs and uh, several other unique things. There's a protein in the brain called alpha-synuclein. There are drugs that are trying to um, clear the alpha-synuclein from the brain to see if that'll slow progression. So there are, are a number of options. Again, you can look at uh, clinicaltrials.gov to, to see what's out there and what uh, you might be available for. Yes, yes. And uh, clinicaltrials.gov is great because it also helps you find some place close to you. I and mean, we want to be able to provide access to where you are and not having to travel or have issues with traveling. Um, so now what I want to do, our um, awesome panelists, um, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, I want to talk a little bit about uh, their journey. They're going to tell us about their journey. I also want to show their journey as well. Uh, Dr. Higginbotham alluded to that window of time. And this window of time, um, once again, goes back to what we've discussed about some of the memory problems that can occur. It's usually not in the first, uh, we don't see cognitive problems initially with the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, um, but after a certain period of time, uh, usually more than three to five years, then there can be some development of that. So sometimes we use deep brain stimulation to help people with uh, problems who cannot tolerate, the people who cannot tolerate their medications such as carbidopa, levodopa, due to side effects and things of that nature. So I'll have them tell their story first. We'll watch the video, video second and then we can, I'll ask you the follow-up question after that. Does that make sense? Just like how we discussed a little bit before, okay? okay. So the question would be, what was your journey, your specific journey? Once again, this is why you chose, you and your family member chose to um, pursue getting the deep brain stimulation? Well, I had already been a part of, um, been accepted to be a part of a study in uh, University of Virginia. And that months went on and uh, I ended up going to, going to uh, Asia for a couple of years and, and uh, 15 years ago, about. Part of, part of the symptoms of um, Parkinson's is um, anxiety. And so um, just to give you a little back history, he was diagnosed about 11 years ago. He was 49 when he was diagnosed and he was uh, diagnosed with early onset Parkinson's. And um, we used to tease him because my husband was very outgoing and spoke in front of people like this would have been nothing. He could have filled up this whole auditorium and stood up and told jokes. Mm -hmm. And once he was diagnosed, all of that changed. Um, and again, it's part of the symptoms, the anxiety. Um, and then um, because it's been over 11 years um, and listening to a lot of you ask questions about things like memory and dementia, that has started to, um, to show in the last year, as well as um, uh, 
uh, he could be in the middle of a sentence and want to tell a story and forget what he wanted to say. So all of that, again, is the progression of the disease. Um, as an educator, um, I said, we're going to do some research. So we did. We did a lot of research on um, what could make his quality of life better. And we were living in Minnesota at the time, and we went to the Parkinson's Struthers um, Center and um, met a neurologist there. And he said, well, you know, I'd like for you to be in the DBS study. And we were about to leave to go to um, the UAE, where I was teaching for a couple of years. And he said, um, no, that we were going to wait for the University of Virginia study. And then um, we went. And while we were there, he got progressively worse. So this video, Dr. Branson, is when we first got back because it, we had to get him some treatment because it had gotten progressively worse. So that's what this video is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you remember what medication the regimen was at at the time of this? It was 50 for four, four times a day. Four times a day. Yep. And anything else? That was it. Okay. So we're going to play this video. How long do you want me to get it, Dad? So tremor being the predominant feature here. Um, challenges with eating. Yeah, that's good. When did uh, you get the DBS, and do you think that it helped uh, with the current regimen of medications that you're on now? So it was right after this that we went to see the neurologist and asked for the DBS. And initially they said no, um, because they didn't feel he had lost his job because of the Parkinson's. And so they didn't feel like there was a reason why he needed to have anything to improve his quality of life. And I remember it like it was yesterday, but the, the neurologist looked at me and I just started crying. And I said, this is not the, the man I married. Did it change how much I loved him? No, but it was not the man that I had married. We, are, um, we have eight children and eight grandchildren. And we wanted to continue to, he wanted to continue to be there for them. So he left the room, came back into the room and said that he had, was going to present his um, because you have to go in front of a panel, smaller panel than this, but they had to um, show cause. First of all, let me, I was trembling going in. First of all, let me not get too far ahead of myself. Um, we was, we, we. Right before the surgery. Oh, right, right before the surgery. I, uh... You were saying before the surgery, you were tremoring, tremoring before going in, and then. Yeah. yeah, I was tremoring before I was going in. They installed the unit, and then I went home another week, had that second surgery. And then as soon as uh, I, I went in trimming pretty bad, as soon as they turned it on, the trimmer stopped. And it's, it's the, the actual surgery is you're awake through the whole surgery. So they can, because they need to, for him to make sure that it's working. So they have to do whatever they do with him awake. So while they were doing whatever they were doing, <laughs> it, this trimmer stopped immediately. And... Since then, he's had the second one. He had the first one, and a couple of years later, they asked if he wanted to have the second one, which he said yes. <laughs> and as you can see, the only tremor that he has is the, the slight tremors when he's holding something, trying to hold it steady. But other than that, he has no tremors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. 
fantastic. And you can see here as well. The interesting part of that, that thank you again, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson. That was fantastic. Thank you for telling that and sharing your journey. And um, just to let people know in the audience, there are different types of surgery uh, for that, and each will be individualized. So theirs was awake. Uh, people can have them while they're asleep as well. Um, and there are also, sometimes people do it on one side, which may be more of a tremor shaking than the other, because some people may have more of a tremor on one side versus the other, or they can have them bilateral both sides that's what they did um, so thank you again I greatly appreciate that and for sharing that uh, to to our community and, and someone uh, with your history we greatly appreciate that what advice um, yes yes Uh, Ms. Johnson, I do want to ask you a follow-up question. Uh, what advice would you give to other care partners who are, who are navigating this journey? I'm not going to sugarcoat it because it's not easy. Um, it takes, it's taken a lot of faith. Um, again, we have eight children. Our children are all involved. Um, even though they don't live here in Georgia, they are all involved in, in my, um, one of my daughters is a runner, so she runs for Parkinson's Organist Foundation um, to raise money. Um, and so each of them play a part in having that um, support group is important because there are days when I don't think I'm gonna make it just because it's hard to watch him um, go down because again, he was so different when we were married. And by the way, I've known this man for 40 years. For 40 years, we've been married for 38 years, um, and um, but having that support group for someone who can you can just talk to, and then um, what my daughters always say to me, Mom, you're not complaining, you're just getting it off your chest so you can release it. That's so important because without having that, um, you could it could bring you down and cause a lot of depression. Your to, in order for you to care for someone that you love and to be able to be there for them, you have to be able to take care of yourself. Yeah. Perfect. Dr. Factor, you were going to, were you going to add or say anything? Okay. The next question is, um, we, thank you again, uh, and Ms. Johnson, I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. And so what we also wanted to do was just to share um, with people about what are some additional treatment options. We talked about exercise, we talked about physical therapy, and we have Ms. Uh, Valeria Gary. Sorry, my apologies, I think you said white before, <laughs> Valeria Gary. Um, and she is actually talking to us a little bit different about speech. Um, so are black or African-Americans with Parkinson's disease less likely to access rehab services like physical therapy and speech therapy? Uh, if so, why? Yes, we have a lot of reason to believe that. And you mentioned in your presentation some of the barriers um, that we face. I thought I would kind of backtrack a little bit because a lot of people know about physical therapy, maybe to some degree occupational therapy, but not so much about speech therapy. So as a speech language pathologist, I work with people with a variety of conditions, including Parkinson's, with speech. And with, with Parkinson's, sometimes a person's speech might sound a little mumbly as the disease progresses. I work with voice. Uh, and again, with Parkinson's, sometimes we notice that voice gets softer and softer. It kind of goes along with that smallness of movement that we see with Parkinson's. You know, the, those, the steps of the walking get smaller, the mouth movements get smaller, handwriting gets smaller. So as a clinician, I'm working to, to counteract that. I also work with people with swallowing difficulties, and as we know, that's one of the um, aspiration pneumonia is a su significant um, thing to worry about with people with Parkinson's. Um, and we also work with cognition, so changes with thinking, memory, et cetera. So, that's, so as a field, we, you know, we work on a lot of different things. Now, when we look at access to rehab services, PT, OT, and speech, there are a lot of steps that take place from someone even just getting diagnosed until they're getting therapy. And with healthcare disparities and health disparities, there can be some roadblocks with that. So the first thing, of course, someone has to notice those symptoms in themselves or in a family member and have that conversation with the doctor. And that can be a barrier sometimes for people of color just going to the doctor and talking about those symptoms. And then the doctor you know, connecting them to the right specialist uh, that would help to get that diagnosis. 
and, and a lot of people in sh who are here, I'm sure you can talk about your experience with getting diagnosed. It's not that you just go to a doctor one time, get the diagnosis, and boom, you're on a path. It, it could take a while to get that diagnosis. So you have to be able to access health care for a period of time in order to keep getting you know, the next test and the next test and the you know, change of the medication. Now, um, some physicians are great at letting people know when they are first diagnosed with Parkinson's the role of exercise and rehabilitation, but not all physicians are there yet. Um, as a foundation, the Parkinson Foundation is working on increasing that awareness um, with physicians. But if someone is not referred to therapy until they have a problem, we can still do therapy, but it's a lot easier to teach someone exercises and to teach strategies and to to teach those red flags before someone gets to the, to the point where we have to make a lot of modifications. We also know that when it comes to clinicians and patients, there can be some um, biases that uh, clinicians might have, um, race-based. So if we have a field such as speech language pathology, which is 92% white we, and 3.5% um, of speech pathologists are black, there could be some barriers within the healthcare system for patients with Parkinson's to get the ideal uh, services that they need. Perfect, yes. Um, thank you again for that. Um, and to just go back to what um, you stated about the initial um, no with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson's uh, journey through deep brain stimulation, you know, and, but they kept fighting, right? They kept pushing through that, even though they received that initial no um, and, you know, we don't know the reason behind that, but we do know that they continued that. They were, they didn't share this. I, they were even going to do that procedure uh, where they were at in, the, um, in another country. So, you know, pushing through some of those barriers and fighting through that um, is a part of our journey and the history that we have to endure sometimes. And so it, sometimes we have to, um, find the right fit uh, and find the right people around us to help us with this journey. I have a few questions from Zoom uh, out there. So I'll ask this and, I just oh, make a speech yeah. therapy comment. Yes, yes. So um, one thing about Parkinson's patients, when they have speech problems, they don't think they do. Uh, the most common comment in the office is, uh, I don't have any trouble with speech. She's deaf. And we hear that a lot. And so it's highly recommended that people go early for speech therapy so that uh, they can get their speech assessed. And sometimes they find out they have more speech problems than they thought they did. And don't forget, swallowing too is a, a big issue that needs to be addressed. But early on, even when you don't think you have speech problems, it's really a good idea to, get, to go for speech therapy and get assessed for that. Yeah, that's fantastic. And most insurance companies cover that as well. We have Nicole Fuller. So Nicole Fuller is our physical therapist. She uh, was originally um, one of our panelists, but I'm going to provide to you what she's saying via Zoom uh, for our live audience. Um, she says that in regards to exercise, as Dr. Branson stated early, intervention and early exercise physical activity is very important. High intensity aerobic big exercise, exercise that focuses on increasing amplitude of movement, cycling, dancing, tai chi, yoga, boxing, which we just did, can all be great ways to stay active. The Parkinson's Foundation has Moving Day Atlanta in October, which is a great opportunity to try different physical activities. Once again, things that can work for you as an individual. Some people love boxing, have a couple of patients who love it. Others may not, or it may not help with their particular symptoms or improve that. She also said, and get a lot of information on local programs and sign up for local research trials. Okay, so I just wanted to add her uh, information as well. Thank you for commenting via Zoom, Nicole. I greatly appreciate it. 
add something else about exercise. So we hear a lot about the boxing and the cycling and everything from, the, from like the neck down, right? All right, however, you know, the muscles for speech and voice are important to exercise too. So we've got the, the facial muscles and we have the muscles of the throat. Now again, ideally, someone will come to a speech pathologist and, and learn how to do the exercises properly because we don't want someone to end up with laryngitis because they're exercising their throat incorrectly. But there are opportunities out there to do some voice-based exercises such as there are some um, choirs for people with Parkinson's. And also the uh, Parkinson Voice Project, Monday through Friday, they go onto their website and they do voice exercises that you can do along with them. And there's also some cognitive exercises that are part of that. It's absolutely free. It's done through Zoom. So you know, don't neglect those other muscles when you're, when you're coming up with your exercise plan. Great, fantastic. So now I'm gonna ask a few more questions via Zoom. We'll start with asking um, anyone who wants to ask any live questions as well. We just have a few questions. Um, and anyone from the panel, you all can answer them as well. So can the importance of keeping a personal daily chart help with managing the symptoms of your illness for treatments to help with the progression of Parkinson's disease? Anyone wants to take that? I'll answer that. Um, I don't, uh, yes, in general, yes. Um, I don't necessarily uh, think you have to do it every day of every hour that you have Parkinson's disease. But um, one way that keeping a little diary is definitely helpful is if you're on a medication like carbidopa levodopa and you're trying to figure out if it's effective or if you're wearing off. So I don't think we said much about wearing off this whole um, this, this session, but it is the most common reason people move on to DBS, like refractory tremor too. But wearing off is a, is a big reason, which means that you're getting to the end of your levodopa doses and that interval and your symptoms are returning. And it is oftentimes super helpful to kind of figure out if a symptom is responding to levodopa, is not responding to levodopa, if you're wearing off, if you're, um, um, those kind of things. I'll, I'll usually try to extract in the visit, like what's unknown, like the patient will tell me about their symptoms. And then I'll, I think it is a little bit up to your neurologist to guide you what to actually track, um, because then you could get bogged down. That's why I said, I don't know if I would just start with a major diary without looking for anything specific or without talking to your neurologist. But if you're given something really um, unique to track, it is definitely helpful in monitoring your symptoms and figuring out which ones, um, or what, what might be done with your medication regimen, or if you would be a candidate for DBS, or if that particular symptom would benefit from DBS or focus ultrasound. Because again, I don't know if this was explicitly stated, but the main things that DBS will help with are things that to some extent levodopa can mitigate or help with as well. So I think it's a conversation a little bit with your neurologist and figuring out what exactly to track, but I think it definitely can be helpful. And um, one other thing that I, I thought, but I think it's leaving me actually, what I was gonna say would be helpful with. Um, did you have something to add? Maybe I'll think of something. Yeah, one other thing is blood pressure. If you get, <laughs> if you get dizzy, we often have people keep blood pressure diaries. But you don't do blood pressure every hour and keep checking yourself. I usually have people check it once a day at different times of the day. The other thing to mention, though, is, you know, there's all these devices now that people can get, these watches and these other things that you can uh, watch your symptoms all day long if you want. But if you get too obsessive with it, it really ruins your quality of life because you're focusing just on your symptoms and not on your life. So be specific about what you want to monitor. Just do it for a finite period of time so that you can answer a question and then um, just live your life and don't go crazy. Great. Can I add really quick? There is something with the DBS. Um, you do have to keep track of when your batteries go dead and we did not do that. And we were out of town and his battery went dead uh, about a year ago. We were visiting our daughter in Charlotte 
and we couldn't figure out what was going on. So his battery had gone completely dead. And once that happens, the tremors come back. But not only do the tremors come back, but there are some other side effects that um, are, can be pretty scary for the, for the patient. Um, so what we ended up doing was getting the DBS that has this rechargeable. And so that is why he has this, this little dandy little thing right here. And um, can I show him really quick? Please, please. Yes. Thank you for doing that. Yes, I remember that. That was a very interesting time. Uh, but we were able to get him in. And Dr. Higginbotham, you wanted to say something while they were showing? No, I was like, I was going to say, please tell me they gave you a rechargeable battery, okay? Because <laughs> um, the rechargeables last up to like 10 to 15 years, whereas the non-rechargeables are about two to five years. Yep. So. And it was the third year when it, we found that it stopped charging. Third year. So this is the rechargeable, and he does this every other day. And it has, this is the charger here, and it goes into this little funny little thing right here. And um, I call him my bionic man, and he puts this on. Because his devices are located in his chest. And so he puts the battery inside here and he charges every other day. And there is, there's a way for him to monitor to tell if he has gone down to a zero. And the doctors recommend that we never go down to 75%, 50%. So like today he got up this morning and he said, well, I'm at 50%, but we didn't have enough time to charge. Cause it does, it can take about 45 minutes to an hour. So when we go home today, he'll charge back up to 100%. I was just going to add to that everybody is a little bit different. I do think tremor patients do end up charging a little bit more than um, other patients because they need higher frequencies and different things like this with their settings. But I do have some patients who charge about once every two weeks. So um, it's a little bit of a range. Right, in that three to five year range as well, the, when it, the battery dies, for those who do not have the recharge mode at three years is usually once again because of the fact that um, they're using the higher frequency. Sorry, one more thing is it's also up to your neurologist too a little bit. We will monitor if you get it. Because I do have some patients who are just like Dr. Higginbotham, I can't even keep my cell phone charged. I just don't want to think about it. So just put it in me. and. And I talked to them definitely about like how the procedure is not to to change the battery is a same typically a same day procedure. It's not as intensive as initial surgery. But I do have some patients, definitely a lot of patients who have non rechargeables, and your neurologist should be following that number. And when it gets to a certain level, should also be helping you keep track of that and sending you for battery replacement. Um, before it actually, there are some cases where it, it just it doesn't work out or miscommunication for sure, but definitely your neurologist should be helping you with that issue. Definitely. So the next question is, are there stages to the disease and how would you know what stage you are in? So yeah, there's a staging scheme. It's called the uh, Hone and Yar scheme. Uh, Margaret Hone and uh, Melvin Yard described it. Actually, they both passed away the same year, a couple of years ago. But this staging s scheme is very old. It's from the 1960s before levodopa came out, but we still use it. And it has been modified a bit, but there are five stages. Uh, stage one is when people have symptoms just on one side and their other side is normal. Stage two is when they have symptoms on both sides. Stage three is when they start to have some balance issues. Stage four is when they have a lot of balance issues. And stage five is when they're in a wheelchair. We almost never see stage five anymore with treatments. Um, there are now some, uh, there's 1.5, right? Stage 1.5, which is you can have symptoms on one side, but a little balance problems. And uh, stage 2.5, I don't remember what that is. Um, 
Do you remember what 2.5 is? It's something, a little more balance issue, I guess. But um, So that's the staging scheme that uh, we generally use. Uh, I have to say I don't use it very much. I use the unified Parkinson's rating scale to, to judge how significant their symptoms are. Also, the Hone and Yar stages don't take into account non-motor symptoms. They only take into account motor symptoms, so you miss out on that when you uh, use that. Yeah, great. 2.5 means mild bilateral disease with recovery on pool test. <laughs> yeah, I'll just echo that I feel like there's not a lot of nuance in those stages, like one side, two sides balance. I mean, there's so much. So I usually try to tell patients not to focus on stages too much, and I oftentimes don't even write it in my notes and really will pay attention more to detail skills. Yeah. I always remember Margaret Hone complaining about the modifications and the point fives and saying that it wasn't made for that purpose. And so, I mean, I keep track of it. We mostly do it in clinical trials. Uh, in fact, in uh, some trials, they require patients to be in particular stages in order to be able to enter into the uh, studies. But uh, I think clinically it doesn't add a whole lot to what we do for you. Okay, great. Thank you. Is it the norm for the medication to work well initially, then will, it, then will it get to a point that it does not work any longer? This is like our, yeah, it's like our soapbox, I think. Um, so in general, we don't like to say that levodopa generally doesn't become less effective or work differently over time. Actually, there's all these... Um, kind of misconceptions out there, particularly that levodopa has a finite lifespan, like you only get like five good years on the medication or 10 good years, and this leads people to really delay um, their treatment or really try other things, which is, is not necessarily a bad thing, but what we've come to learn over the years, and there have been studies that looked at this, um, is that there is not really a downside to starting levodopa early on. Um, the reason why people wear off over time, that's what usually when people talk about levodopa becoming quote unquote less effective, meaning that they are, they are just not seeing the same duration of symptom control with each dose that they used to. Um, what these studies have shown is that the wearing off is not necessarily from the particular dose of levodopa you're taking or the particular timing that you started it or how many years you've been taking it. It really just depends on your disease progression. So that underlying process that's continuing to happen where dopamine cells are being lost and the disease is progressing, that usually is what is dictating um, whether or how, how much um, wearing off you have, even how much dyskinesia you have. It's really about the disease progression. And if that's not right, quite clicking to you just yet, I always like to talk about the study that was um, done in um, sub-Saharan Africans, actually. Um, and they looked at a sub-Saharan African Parkinson's population. And the reason they did that was because they don't have availability of levodopa like we right. do. So right. they got it later. They got it later, and they compared it to patients in, I think, Italy or... Yeah, a place where they definitely get levodopa earlier. And so if levodopa had a finite lifespan, you would think that even though the patients in sub-Saharan Africa who started it later would still have about five years, right, or 10 years, whatever the average that the Italians were having, which was years of before wearing off, right? But that's not what they showed. They showed that the Sub-Saharan African patients, which usually started levodopa later in their disease, only had about less than a year of good, uh, before they wore off on the levodopa. It was delayed, but it's not like it was just a finite lifespan dependent on the medication. It was because they were later on in their disease that they ended up wearing off so quickly, quote unquote. So it really is a... Um, it really is a function of your disease progression. And so in our practice, a lot of times we will not necessarily delay levodopa um, because it is the most direct form of dopamine replacement. It is usually most effective. 
And so even for young patients, particularly sometimes young patients who are still working and need to be really high functioning, we will use the most effective medication. And generally, um, there's not a downside to doing that. Perfect, thank you. I sometimes, I mean, if a person comes in and they have really minimal symptoms and they want to wait, I tell them that it's okay to wait, we're fine with that, but don't wait too long. And you really lose a period of time when you get, when you can feel normal on the medication. So don't be afraid to start it early. Perfect. Thank you. And that goes back to getting the diagnosis and getting in early as well. I think that this question might be for Ms. Gary. Um, what are... Oh my gosh. I'm sorry, they're just coming in quick and fast here. Um, so what are the panelists' thoughts about diet and Parkinson's disease? I've read research about the connection between insulin and dopamine. My apologies, not that one. No one thought? Well, th there's a phenomenon called insulin intolerance that uh, is seen in a variety of disease, even in diabetes. There's uh, some people who are insulin intolerant. And it seems like the uh, insulin, I, I don't know the details about this, maybe Dr. Branson knows a little more, but uh, it seems like there are some um, uh, effects on the dopamine cells in relation to insulin intolerance. That's what led to, I mentioned earlier, the use of some diabetic drugs to try and treat Parkinson's disease, which by the way, have mostly failed actually at this point. So uh, we don't really understand that aspect very much as far as insulin is concerned. Yeah, yeah, we, we don't have, we haven't made that connection uh, for nutrition and diet. I stated before the Mediterranean diet is very uh, effective uh, for the, to help with uh, Parkinson's disease. So sometimes uh, decreasing or less uh, amount of that can improve some of the symptoms, but there's no connect, direct connection that we have found as of yet with mm -hmm. insulin and dopamine. I'll just, uh, just a separate comment about uh, diet, that high protein meals can impact the absorption of levodopa. So um, now I don't always recommend that people time their dosing in relation to food because you know most people don't notice a difference. Uh, some people though notice it and then we recommend a half hour, an hour, separating the, the meal from the uh, doses. I was just generally going to say that um, a lot of times, I don't know if the, there's been a particular diet known to slow disease progression or Parkinson's, but definitely Mediterranean diet and something called the DASH diet are good for overall brain health is what generally they've, they've shown. So it can impact different neurological indices, not necessarily Parkinson's disease. So usually I'll tell patients that in general for brain, I think somebody asked like, what in general can we do to like help ourselves? And there's just basically three different things and they sound really probably a little bit uh, common and not very complex, but they, they have data that they help. And one is to eat like a good diet, like measuring and dash diet. Another one is actually to maintain social behavior so definitely loneliness is a risk factor for worse neurological disease and dementia and or social isolation, I should say, too. Um, so maintaining social behavior is good. Uh, this is just a joke I make in clinic, but I usually say your spouse doesn't quite count because you could probably talk to them in your sleep. So um, like just maintaining friendships and fam other family members is really good. And then finally, as we've talked a lot about this exercise. So. So one other thing about Mediterranean diet, psychiatry, our psychiatrists say that Mediterranean diet is very good for mood also and uh, preventative for uh, depression, anxiety, so worthwhile for that too. Right, so you get a two for one, right? You The non-motor symptoms that may occur and also uh, with helping of the progression of the disease as well. I think this question may be for Anne uh, Johnson. Do you have advice for a caregiver taking care of a PD patient that is experiencing mental health problems that are impeding proper PD care. I don't know if you can directly relate to this, but this is 
question mark, and then it says this is post DBS. Yes. Um, patience is the number one because they can tend to um, react harshly at first, but with patience and um, communication is huge. Is being able to explain to them, you know, I care about you, but these, this is what I'm seeing. Um, especially after COVID was really hard because we were together 24 seven and I was teaching online and he wanted my attention when I was teaching online and he didn't understand at first that I needed space. So it was just me being able to communicate with him that. Um, and then also when I think about everything that you all just talked about, uh, that exercise, he, was, he started to get out and walk just in the neighborhood for his own mental health really helps with the anxiety a lot. And I'm working on that, not counting your wife because right now it's just me and him. <laughs> so we're working on that um, because that's, it, it makes a difference because he does not want to go out and socialize with others other than just our family who understand um, his struggles with um, communicating, even the communication on the f telephone is really hard for him. And so, yeah, it's, it's a struggle, but every day is a new day. That's the way we look at it, that we wake up in the morning, we start a new day, and we fight the battles that come with Parkinson's disease. Great, thank you so very much. I think we have one more question. Oh, we're gonna keep it going. We have several questions here. <laughs> So one of the question is, my question is, if the symptoms are due to lack of dopamine in the brain, why are the symptoms still sometimes present? My husband has had DBS and also takes carbidopa levodopa four times a day. Anybody wants to tackle that? Sorry, just to clarify, why are the symptoms present still right present? if the symptoms are due to a lack of dopamine they now have dbs mm -hmm. but the questioner wants to know why are the symptoms still sometimes why are the symptoms still sometimes present oh i see okay yeah um so i think so there's uh, yes all of the parkinsonian disorders most notably parkinson's disease are due to a lack of dopamine in the brain. Um, and then there are some symptoms that are responsive to dopamine replacement. And then there are other symptoms that are not responsive to dopamine replacement. I think that's important to note. Um, so the ones that are most responsive to dopamine replacement, such as levodopa. So we're basically, if anybody just is not sure how levodopa works. It's the most direct form. It goes straight to the brain with the help of carbidopa. So don't get L-dopa supplements that they sell you online because they don't have carbidopa. It won't get to your brain. Okay, you gotta get the prescription with the carbidopa that helps it get to the brain and it gets turned directly into dopamine in the brain. And so that form of dopamine replacement will help certain symptoms, maybe not all symptoms, but definitely certain symptoms. And the best symptoms or the symptoms that best respond to that dopamine replacement are certain motor symptoms. So those are things like tremor. The tremor can get to, an, as disease progresses, tremor can get to an amplitude where, or a degree that levodopa cannot completely suppress it over time, which is why people end up getting DBS. But levodopa tends to help with tremor. It tends to help with the slowness of the disease and the stiffness of the disease. Um, somebody earlier asked about gate freezing and they were, I think they're having problems with turning and I don't know, it sounded like maybe you're freezing. So freezing is a little bit variable. So sometimes there's certain freezing that will respond to levodopa and sometimes freezing that won't. But the, the best symptom, the symptoms that are most responsive are tremor, slowness, and stiffness. Now, like we discussed before, over time, as your disease progresses, dopamine replacement may not be able to overcome the progression of the disease um, consistently throughout the day, so that you have to usually take 
more and more dopamine throughout the day more frequently, or at some point, which is what DBS is so good at, is um, we do have other medications, adjunct medications or procedures like DBS that help with that wearing off phenomenon. And then to the DBS question about it, DBS is not necessarily increasing dopamine in the brain. So once you get DBS, you still have to take your dopaminergic medicine, your levodopa. Then the two work together to help eliminate the wearing off episodes. A little secret about DBS is that we know it's helpful, but we're not exactly sure what it's doing to the actual um, tracks exactly or actually how it's directly impacting disease. I know it's hard to think, but we know it's, it's a good intervention because we've seen it work. It kind of, I could talk all day about it, but it kind of sp spans out of the um, early days when they were like putting lesions in the brain. They discovered that the stimulation mimics that and works. But there's a lot of questions about what it's actually doing, but it's not necessarily just increasing dopamine, actually. It mimics levodopa to a degree, so it studies your control of your symptoms all day, but it's not necessarily impacting the dopamine levels. And so I think maybe um, to that question's point, you know, and then again, there are certain symptoms like a lot of the non-motor issues, depression, anxiety, um, autonomic dysfunction, like blood pressure issues. Dopamine replacement does not do much for that, unfortunately. And it can even, in terms of like blood pressure, worsen it, actually. So um, those things are usually treated other ways. I'll just make a comment. I think we tend to oversimplify what Parkinson's disease is, right? So we say it's a dopamine disease because we know dopamine has the most profound effect and especially on the motor symptoms. But what we've learned is the disease kind of spreads through the brain. It starts uh, low down in the brain. Where it actually starts is not clear, but starts in the lower parts of the brain and works its way up. And in addition to dopamine, it affects other symptoms, other systems. So serotonin is another a uh, neurotransmitter that's affected that is associated with um, things like depression and other mood issues and uh, norepinephrine associated with blood pressure. Uh, so there are various other systems that are affected and the, as the disease rises and the, the higher parts of the brain uh, become involved, that's when cortical or, or uh, cognitive symptoms start. So. We never really make all the symptoms go away because Parkinson's is probably likely more than just dopamine, and that's why dopaminergic drugs don't resolve every issue. Right, and why we need more research, right, regarding Absolutely. understanding and treatment. Thank you all. Thank you for the panelists. I greatly appreciate it. Any last comments or thoughts that you may want it to address, or um, if you had someone within our community that you wanted to just stress that maybe you didn't get a chance to, it, anyone can speak at this time. Just to repeat what we said before, when it comes to therapy, um, don't be afraid to ask for therapy if your doctor does not mention it to you. It doesn't mean that you're going to be in therapy for months and months and months from a speech, physical, or occupational therapy standpoint, but maybe just enough to get some tools to help to slow the progression of the motor symptoms or some of the cognitive symptoms that you're having. Great, great. I would just say um, if you think you have something wrong that relates to Parkinson's or any disease, contact your doctor early. Uh, early intervention is always better. And, um, you know, there's always a stigma about disease. We should try to sort of shed that. Um, I think, you know, as many of you know, many famous people have had Parkinson's disease, Muhammad Ali being one of them. Uh, he was never stigmatized by that at all. Um, and also consider research because we can't make advances in the disease without us partnering with you in order to um, uh, learn new things and, and move forward. Yeah, I just just echo all of that. And um, I, one other thing I'll just say again, it, some of it is on us to do the correct type of studies. I think um, there is a push to do that. Looking at the Alzheimer's disease community, to be frankly honest, they've done a lot of, they have these 
Alzheimer's disease research centers and do these large longitudinal studies where they do go out into the community, churches, like um, retirement centers, and they really get out there and recruit these people basically like door to door. And doing all that over the years, they found that African Americans actually can have up to two times more the risk of certain types of dementia, including Alzheimer's. And so I think definitely we have not done much of that in the Parkinson's community. And we do have some centers like Udall centers are opening up. Emory has one. I know they have a big initiative going forward that started about last year to, to do stuff like that, reach out more to the community. So um, I also think, you know, some of it is on us to do the right type of studies, but um, doing all kinds of educational community programs like this also really helps. So anyway, thanks for coming. We just want to thank you, Dr. Branson, and your team for, for doing this, because this is really important, um, because the one thing that my husband said when we first got here was that he no longer feels like he's an island, because there are other African-American male and females who are struggling with what he is struggling with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the live audience. Thank you to the people out in the virtual world. Um, I greatly appreciate this phenomenal panelist. And we could talk, I mean, we could go on and on, um, highlighting some of the most important parts of Parkinson's disease. Dr. Keisha Young from Wellstar is here. Thank you again for all of the physicians and providers who are here and also online virtually. Uh, we greatly appreciate you and we want to just provide you with various understanding of who in your, at least in the Georgia area, um, have access to the movement specialists in, in where near you. You know, we don't want it to be such an overburden um, issue with you driving or traveling too far from your, um, your area or location. And then just also just getting the word out about the disease, the progression of the disease and how it really works and how we understand it. So thank you. And I'm gonna give it back to Ms. Cooper. Thank you. This was really great, right? We've learned so much. So much was shared. You know, I'm happy. You're happy. Uh, it brings so much awareness to how important it is for us to know exactly what the challenges are, what we need to continue to do as a team, as a family, uh, to address the issues and the concerns of uh, Parkinson and bringing it to light. And uh, we want to, again, thank all our many, many sponsors who made this event happen today. Let's give them a hand clap. Thank you, sponsors. We cannot do this by ourselves. We have to do it in unity because in unity there is strength. And we need you online. We need you to spread the word because we truly believe that if each one teach one, then the movement for people who've been diagnosed with Parkinson will allow them to continue to have not just a good life, but the best life ever, right? Thank you so much. Uh, we're now going to conclude today's program by bringing up Ms. Juanita Farr, the Director of Clinical Affairs at the Parkinson Foundation to the podium. And thank you again for allowing me to serve as a facilitator today. I've learned so much, and now I'm going to be a champion for the Parkinson's. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the Parkinson's Foundation, I would like to again thank our speakers, our panelists, sponsors, and most importantly, thank you for being here today. I'd like to give an extra shout out to our, to Ms. Pamela Cooper, our mistress of ceremony today, who's done an awesome job. I would just like to spend a few moments on providing you with some information about the Parkinson's Foundation and what we're doing in this space. The Parkinson's Foundation is the nation's largest community of support for people living with PD, those who love and care for them, and for those who work endlessly to improve care and identify a cure. Information is vital, as we've heard today. So we would encourage you to visit the Parkinson's Foundation helpline. It can be accessed via telephone or the internet. The helpline is staffed with trained PD specialists 
and the information, education, and resource is available to you at no cost. And all the material is also available in English as well as Spanish. Birth out of the pandemic to ease the challenges of an interactive series of foundation launch, what we call PD Health at Home, an interactive series of virtual events designed for the Parkinson's community. Every week, you can join what we call Mindfulness Mondays, Wellness Wednesdays that feature ex experts discussing PD topics, and each Friday, we provide a PD-specific exercise video. In addition to living well with Parkinson's disease, the foundation is also focused on advancing research towards a cure. In order to accomplish this, as was stated earlier today, we need to increase the diversity in clinical trials to understand the specific needs of the African American community. If you have a confirmed diagnosis of PD, please consider participating in PD Generation, Mapping the Future of PD. You will receive genetic testing for PD-related genes and also genetic counseling at no cost. To start, you can contact Dr. Brunson here at Morehouse or you can contact the Parkinson's Foundation at parkinsons.org slash pdgeneration. In addition to making research more inclusive and ensuring that information, care, and resources are accessible to all, we are intentionally focusing on ways to remove barriers to care. Communication is key to this, and so the foundation has partnered with blackdoctor.org and Black Health Matters in hopes of sharing information and reaching our community wherever they may be. If research is your passion or you desire to be more involved with the goal of increasing engagement within the African American community, we invite you to attend the Parkinson's Foundation 2022 Learning Institute that will be held in collaboration with Morehouse School of Medicine in November. There you will learn more about research, Parkinson's community priorities, and the importance of being a research advocate through this, interact through this personal training. For more information, um, you can contact patient engagement at parkinsons.org. Although we are a national organization, we do have a strong local presence due to the amazing work from our local chapter members. I encourage you, if you have not already done so, to connect with the Georgia Parkinson's chapter. There are several education events taking place throughout the remainder of the year in Johns Creek, Brunswick, Georgia, and in Atlanta, they will be hosting the Southeast Regional Care Partner Summit. Stay tuned for more information. This year, we'll, we, we will also be celebrating our 10th annual Moving Day Atlanta Walk for Parkinson's on October the 22nd at Piedmont Park. Your participation will help us to continue to provide resources, services that impact quality of life, and I would also say that it is a day of movement and connection. You can register for that event at movingdayatlanta.org. And finally, in closing, again, we thank you. Please take time to complete the program evaluations. The, um, this informs us in future event topics and needs, um, that, and needs that we can address in future education opportunities. For those of you that are attending via Zoom, once the meeting closes, a, web link, a link will pop up that will give you the opportunity to complete that evaluation virtually. Again, we thank you and enjoy the rest of your weekend.